Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alvo here with kissandlock.com. So today we're going to go over transformers uh, quickly, kind of discuss the difference of an EI core and a toroid and a little theory behind them and just so background information so you understand better about inductors and transformers. Okay, thanks. Let's jump into it. Welcome guys. I want to talk a little bit about the EI versus toroid transformer and that this uh, kind of relates to the the core um, of the of the device why why I think the toroid is better than the EI core I think everybody kind of agrees with that I just want to explain how they're made um, and you know the some of the theory behind this so let's just talk about transformer a little bit and I want to apologize ahead of time for my drawings not so hot but I'll attempt to draw the primary of a transformer, okay? So, I'm going to draw one primary and draw another one. Often, when we um, go find these transformers, these power transformers, they'll come with two primary cores, or, I'm sorry, two primary windings. So, I want to draw two, and, and then... Uh, for this power supply, for this audio amplifier, it you know they often come with two secondaries. Um, sometimes they come with a single secondary with a center tap. So if it's a center tap, I just bring a wire out, I tie a wire to my my wire that I'm winding around the core, and I bring that out for the center tap and just keep on winding. But in this case, I think in most cases these days, the ones we're looking at don't have the center tap. They actually give you two windings. You, you think there's not much difference in that, but it actually gives you a lot of freedom in what you want to do. Like you can connect these together, and which in, in our case, we will. So I'll just show that. We're gonna connect those together, and we're gonna call this secondary ground, okay? So I'm calling this side the primary side, and this is the secondary side. There's isolation, they show these bars. That's not to show an isolation. <laughs> That's to show the bars or the iron core of the transformer. That's what that signifies. But it, it kind of does show the boundary between primary and secondary. So current on the power side, on the primary side, let's draw an AC source here. AC source, we'll connect that up to this guy. And now if we would have connected it down to this one, we could tie these two windings together and we could use a 240 volt input. But for 120 volt input, or, or often I think these transformers are still rated in the 115s instead of 120, which I think the 120 is today's standard, plus or minus 5%. But what, regardless, all it means is that if it is designed for 115 and it says it's 22 volt on the output, it, it's going to be roughly 5% higher than that and so you have a little bit more voltage on the output but at the same time remember this voltage has a tolerance of plus or minus 5% so this voltage can actually drop down to this voltage so that kind of means that when you pick out transfer at 115 that you've kind of selected a voltage on the output at the bottom of the tolerance, which is nice because you know that you have at least a minimum voltage you need on the output. Okay, so then, so in our case, we're going to take uh, the top of this winding and bring up and connect to this, and we'll bring this one and connect it to the minus. So I say the top, so these core coils should have a dot to show the polarity of the coil and relative to the other coil. Doesn't mean you have to hook up, I mean this is AC power so it doesn't matter how it's hooked up, whether you take your transformer and flip it over or what, you know, as long as the two dots are connected together on this side and the two non-dots are connected. Now if each one of these windings are rated for let's say 5 amps, um, when you put them in series, or I'm sorry, when you put them in parallel like this, you can get 10 amps on this side. Um, but um, when you put them in series for 220, you get 5 amps. It's still the same power because you have a higher voltage 
half the current and in this case you can do double the current with half the voltage 120 okay so now this is our secondary wine here's our our other secondary wine this will go to our bridge rectifier okay um, but so when when we do this important thing is isolation the other important thing about this isolation is that these windings is copper um, winding you if you've seen this wire it just looks like bare copper but in fact it has a varnish on it so it, it's insulated it's an insulated uh, they call it magnet wire it's an insulated wire um, for winding but you're required for UL and that to put a layer of insulation between the primary side and the secondary side because you never want there to be a voltage breakdown between primary and secondary. You always want the ice. They call that double reinforced insulation or you know it's it's you got the varnish plus you got this tape okay so um, and then uh, let's see what okay so then on the output we'll, we'll end up calling this plus because it's going to go to our plus side of our, our rectifier and this will go to our minus but that might be a little confusing maybe I should keep this as AC here because when you go to the bridge rectifier let me just draw a bridge rectifier just draw a square on its corner and then draw these connect it and when you connect this it'll be an AC uh, sign here an AC sign here so you come over and tie your bridge rectifier like that and then you have a plus here and a minus here that's your bridge now you want to get your diodes in there just know that the voltage here is going to go plus towards that and the diodes show the direction of the current flow conventional flow not electron so it shows positive going that way so this one has to be that way too and then uh, these are going to be the opposite because this is going to be negative this is going to be your negative terminal come down here this is going to be your minus V and this will be your plus V. So now we show our, our diodes in reverse. Okay, so um, kind of the, this is, well, let me see, this is the cathode, and this is the anode. And there's roughly about one volt drop across that diode. So when you have current flow, you have one volt drop here, and you'll have. Um, sorry about that. So when you have current flow, you have one volt drop across this diode. It'll go out to your load, come back here, and it'll flow this way back here. So then you have another volt drop here. And then the next cycle, the current will flow you know from this direction up here out to your load back here now this way and back that way so you have these two uh, diodes working so those two diodes and then these two diodes and they steer the voltage this way so then you have your capacitors out here your bulk capacitors and they're tied in series just like this winding is and it'll have a ground in the center of it just like here that connects to here so um, so this is your center reference and you get two pulses here and you get two pulses here you get two minus pulses here and two plus pulses here that's why you have four diodes okay but we're talking about the transform I just wanted to kind of show this is all you see over here it's DC once you get past the rectifier so the current here is alternating you know it goes back and forth so the current stays here and it stays around here okay or you can think of it cycling this way if you want but then on this side the currents stay in here so these currents never mix they're magnetically coupled so that's what I want to talk about next how does that happen well let's say you have a uh, iron rod okay and you take your AC power source and you wrap a wire 
okay? And let's just say I did 120 turns, okay? And this is 120 volts. So that's essentially one turn, or I'm sorry, one volt per turn. So one volt per every turn. One volt per one turn. So if I want 10 volts out here, I have to put 10 turns on it because I get one volt for every turn. So if I want 22 volts, say a plus or minus 22 volts out here, right? I said plus or minus again. I, this is AC, so there's not plus or minus, but it, you know, I guess I'm thinking once it comes out here. So if you want two 22 volt windings, you come in here and you wrap those. But before I show you that, I want to show you how they couple. If this is an iron rod and you do this, you know, it turns it, you know, you can put DC current and if, if you put AC current, you know, okay, if this is an iron rod, you can hook up a DC current source to it and turn it into a magnet, right? Um, and, okay, so what I want to talk about is how does this transformer work? And it's magnetic coupling. And that's what I want to talk about. If this is an iron rod with current flowing through it, you get flux lines coming out of one end and they just radiate out and they radiate all the way around and they're sucked back in on to the other end okay now this isn't two-dimensional like my paper it actually comes out of the paper it comes around I mean it it looks like uh, you know basically like a football it's coming out everywhere and coming in the other end okay those flux lines um, if you have a circuit nearby, they want to find the path of least, least impedance. So they'll go through your circuit and they'll, then they'll come out of it and, and finish their, their travels to the other end. Um, that can upset your circuitry, so um, we put shielding around some of these things. These, um, if you see an inductor, it's just a rod. Um, it's kind of the worst case scenario as far as magnetic shielding because there is you know with just a rod without any shielding there's you get all this flux and uh, so now if you want to take this other winding and wrap around here and come off with a, a secondary say secondary one and then you come around here secondary two now you have a transformer um, it's coupled to this iron core, the flux lines. Um, it's better than an air core if they're just wrapped around air. Um, you've seen air core inductors for um, crossover filters and so on. They do that because it's cheaper than using iron. You'd have to use a lot of iron for how much current some of these um, crossovers are made from. And, uh, and so that's you know one point I want to make about this iron. When you put a piece of iron in there, it has to be big enough to handle the current that you're going to put through it or around it because it's got to handle enough flux lines. Um, otherwise, it becomes saturated and it basically becomes a short. So, now, so often they call an inductor a choke, and that's because as the current flows through this AC current, um, there's a certain impedance this inductor has to that current. Otherwise, this would just short out your AC voltage source. So your X of L, they call it, it's kind of like R, but X of L is equal to two pi frequency times your inductance. So it's two pi times your frequency times inductance. That tells you how much impedance you have to this. So you want some pretty good impedance on this guy so that you don't have very much current flowing until you get a load. Once you get a load, then, then you're going to draw more current because this load's going to pull energy off of this core. So to keep on putting energy into the core, you have to put more current. But when you're not pulling current off the core, then you don't want a lot of current flowing so you want a high inductance on your primary winding okay so this secondary winding one secondary winding two um, to make this a better core what you can do is you can say well I'm gonna 
help this flux get around this air without you know without traveling through air I'm going to give it a better path so I'm going to make this iron core and I'm going to expand this iron out like this let's see you do that so here's my iron okay so now you can see how the flux lines will travel in this iron but now you have this end open so you go well okay I'll close it off with the I so there you go your EI core there's your E I core that's where that comes from okay now you've got a nice magnetic structure um, the problem with this is it's not quite perfect because it's kind of square and you got these even though these beams are cut with a very fine um, you know surface those surfaces together no matter how smooth they look to your eye they look gigantic to flux lines so you get some fringing and depending on how unperfect those are you get more and more fringing and if you get a lot of current you, you know you just get more fringing that fringing can actually melt wire so being here on the ends is very good because you don't have wire there you keep it here okay um, so as far as the size of the structure goes, you had to make this center beam big enough, this center pole big enough to carry the flux. But now the flux gets to divide up this and these two paths. And also it's it's going on in this piece of material in half, you know, so um, so this piece and this piece and and you know all around here could have been half the size of this guy. But the way these uh, cores are made is they take a bunch of thin plates and they stack them on top of each other. A bunch of E plates and a bunch of I plates and just stack them on top. And then they laminate them so that they don't vibrate with that 60 or 120 hertz. Um, so also the copper wire can vibrate against them. So they, they put varnish and, they, and they, keep, they try to keep that from happening even though you might still get some buzzing. So, this is a pretty good structure. It's a lot better than just the rod. Um, but then along comes a toroid. So, if you think about that iron rod, if, it, if you could have bent iron and connected the ends together, you would have had a toroid, a donut. Um, sometimes they're referred to as donuts. So, um, in this case, the iron had to be large, twice as large as it needed to be to because of this, this drove the size of the transformer. But also these windows, they call them, have to be large enough to get enough wire into them. So that's, you know, they have to decide how big they're gonna make the windows and then they have to make, you know, the whole structure uh, big enough to support this center beam. So this, that's why this guy gets to be large. This guy, he's just, instead of having to have the flux lines come out like this, you just, connect them together so the flux lines don't have to leave the structure they can stay inside so the flux just stays inside so this guy has to be big enough to carry that flux but you know that's all he has to do now this guy instead of being made of plates this guy is usually made out of iron powder um, and if it's and then that way it's it's it doesn't have this fringing problem okay um, so it's smaller because you're only using the iron you need to, uh, to contain the flux and then this hole has to be big enough to get the copper wire in so those are the only two things you're dealing with as far as physical size when they wrap the windings around here let's say the primary side they come on they they wrap it they don't just finish here and come off they they wrap it all the way around and then they come off so that it's going all the way around the core and this is your primary and then they'll come you know you can do it any, you know, start finishing where you want but let's say they come here and they come around and they call this S1 and then they come around 
and they call this S2. Really, if you're you know watching, if you're if you're winding one of these, you actually have to go around clockwise for every one, or you have to flip the lines. If you start clockwise, let's say you start with this wire, end with this one, you can call this your dot, and then you end with this one. Um, if you start with this one, you go clockwise, you can call that your dot. So, um, and then same thing with this guy. So then you want to go clockwise. Let's say if you wound this one counterclockwise, you want to put your dot on this side. So, same thing over here. You going uh, clock? You know, you're going clockwise or counterclockwise. You want to be the same. That's how you get the polarity on this. So when the field is getting generated on this, and a certain polarity that they're all polarized the same way. So as they come up, you know, AC field builds up, collapses, builds up, collapses. You want them all building up at the same end at the same time. You don't want them 180 degrees out of phase. That would be if you misplaced a dot. So that's kind of, that's why um, toroids are smaller. Now the flux lines are self-contained, they call it. They stay within the core. Where here, they pretty much do, but it's not, you know, it's not a perfect circle. It's, it's not as good as structure, and so you'll often see shielding around one of these cores that will wrap a foil or something. And sometimes you see people shield these too. Sometimes they'll put primary winding down. Let's see you have two primary windings. They'll put your primary windings down, and then they'll put a shield, a copper tape, or even just a wire, and then they'll put um, your secondaries down so that they can show some noise between your primary and secondary. Okay, so I hope that helps explain why toroids are better than EI cores. They're smaller, uh, they have less magnetic field to interfere with your other circuitry, and uh, the EI core is good, but just not quite as good as a toroid. All right, well, thanks, guys. Now, when you do, um, you know, select these, you want to be cognizant of the copper size and, you know, and how much heat dissipation that they say you get with a certain VA rating, okay? Okay, thanks. Give me a thumbs up if, if this was helpful.